Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to the EduSight Network. Today we are going to discuss power and its elements in uh, world politics and for this very lecture we have this in our studio. Our subject expert Dr. Prajita Kashyap, Assistant Professor, School of Law and Legal Studies, Guru Gobind Singh in the Prasa University, New Delhi and friends with this very brief introduction, I welcome ma'am to our studio. Ma'am, thank you so much for yes. coming and I also request you to begin our today's okay. lecture. Uh, a very warm welcome to all the viewers. Uh, the format of today's lecture is that we would be discussing what is power, we would be defining power, we would be uh, discussing the important characteristics of power and then we will go on to discuss the different elements of power. Uh, when we talk about the different elements of power, uh, these are the different parameters which together, which com combined together uh, determine the power of a nation, of a nation state. So uh, when we begin, I would just like to uh, begin my lecture by discussing the two important schools of international relations. When I'm discussing power today, I'm mostly talking about politics and international relations. You know, we have a concept of national power. So the national power is confined within the territories of a state. But when this spills out while determining international relations, it becomes a problem. So we are not only confining ourselves to power or national power, we are going to discuss beyond national territories, we are going to talk about the use of power in international relations. Now if we talk about the two schools of thought that may be relevant to today's lecture, we have to discuss about idealism. This, this school of thought, it believed in essential goodness of human behavior and the different communities and it always believed that these communities, the good human nature, all these will work together to overcome any mutual problem that may arise. And this is one of the reasons why the League of Nations was formed. So if we were to talk about one of the important proponents of this idealism, then Morgan um, Woodrow Wilson comes to our mind. Now there were other, there was this other school of thought which was quite opposed to this view of essential goodness of human community, essential goodness of human behavior. So this school of thought was called realism. And if we talk about realism, then realism explains international relations in terms of pursuit for power. So they go on to say, they have, they don't bite their word, they don't mince their words, they just go on to say that whatever is being done in international relations, in politics, is all about gaining more and more power. And you know, this is when the problem arises. So this, if this pursuit for power goes unchecked, then we would be having states, one state annihilating the other state. So in order to keep a check on this pursuit of power or to balance this, we have what are known as limitations of power. So that may be discussed in another lecture. As of now, we're going to discuss uh, the most important elements of power. Now, in terms of power, when we talk about actors, Anybody who chooses power to achieve ends in politics are known as actors. So the actor may be a leader, it may be a state, it may be an ideology. So these are the different parameters that we are going to keep in mind while discussing power. Now to begin with, now as I told you, uh, realists say that the entire world politics can be understood if we just understand what is this concept or notion of power. So for realists, they do not believe in goodness. They just believe that power is the game. Power is the, is, is the motive for which all the states exist. So I would just like to define that if, uh, uh, how power has been looked at by different thinkers. Now, 
as we all know sovereign nations aspire for more and more power and in this pursuit then morgenthau goes on to say that power is the capacity to gain control over mind and actions of other men he says that international politics is governed by power based on prudence and practicality so uh, so he says that it's not only about annihilating we just force them to do what we want to do and the international politics according to morgenthau is based on pra practicality and prudence on the other hand in a related definition robert dahl says it is the power is the ability to get another actor to do what it would otherwise would not have done or vice versa that we would force somebody to do what a uh, force somebody somebody not to do what they would have wanted to do so these are the two important definitions by of uh, power now supposing we try and we we know about a concept called influence and there is another concept called power there is another no concept called force now if we were to go by strict definition power force and influence all are different but if we go we're using a, a loose terminology maybe they would spill over each other but in strict definition terms they are quite different i would just like to cite an example for example the secretary of state of united states he has influence over the vice president because he through his inputs can affect the decision which the president is going to make but it is purely up to the president whether to be influenced by the secretary of state or not on the other hand the president has power over the secretary of state if he makes a policy or he takes a decision the secretary of state has to abide by that decision so this is this is an important difference between power and influence that is that the secretary of state he he has no choice because the president has power over him so i would just like to explain this through this circular logic which says power exerts influence and the influence that a person ex person or a state exerts it can determine power but they are not equivalent terms so going by all this now let us uh, come to a general acceptable definition of power and that is power is the ability to influence based on tangible tangible includes physical economic military strength and intangible elements intangible elements include ideology diplomacy mindset of the leaders so taken together the tangible and intangible element how they influence decision making is known as power now moving on from here we would just like to look at the different characteristics of power what are the different characteristics of power if we go by um, legal theory of sovereignty one important thing is that according to principles of sovereignty irrespective of the size of a nation they are equal so it it talks about sovereign equality of nation states so long as a nation is sovereign irrespective of the size irrespective of the economic uh, achievements a nepal would be as strong as a united states so this is a strict legal theory but if we go into practical and factual interpretation of equality we don't see there is equality so this is how power varies you you talk about a powerful nation and a weak nation a big power and a small power so this is the ground reality now let us look at the characteristics of power characteristics of power we have to understand that it is a the most important thing is that it is a relative concept you cannot talk about power in isolation or vacuum so it is a relative concept so there have to be more than two actors in order for the power to be exerted now whenever the, it's a concept of relativity there is a relationship between the different actors and 
in terms of power, this relationship is always of domination and subordination. So one becomes a dominant power and the other is a subordinate power. Now, the third characteristic of power is that it is often used to achieve the desired ends in international relations. So if you have to attain an end, and this is not idealism we are talking about, we are talking about strict realism. Realism feels that if you have to achieve a goal, then the method that you're going to adopt is power. And the power may vary. You could use economic power or military power or your ideological power, but, but nonetheless, it is power which helps you achieve your goal. And the fourth most important characteristic is the state or the agent of the state, which is the government, is the most important repository of power. So we do not talk about gang leaders or we do not talk about tribal leaders or so whenever we talk in terms of power in international relations especially just it the uh, the entity which comes to our mind or what we figure out are the states or the agents of the state that is the government so we have to confine ourselves strictly to power as used by the state or the agents of the state now, having looked at the definition, the characteristics, we go on to define what are the different types of power. And if we look at the screen, I have classified power on three bases. The first basis is on the basis of capability to exert influence. So how much influence on account of your resource or your size or your economic development you are able to exert is the way in which you classify a country into a small power, a middle power, or a great power, or even a hegemon. So a small power is one which is hardly able to exert its influence. So we, if we talk about lesser power or small power, uh, Nepal or Bhutan would come to mind. If we talk about middle powers, these have a, a a sizable presence, but they are not very predominant, but they have a sizable presence. So countries like India and Brazil are the examples of a middle power. If we come to think about great powers, we can think about Germany, we can think about UK. But nonetheless, in the recent times, we have uh, seen the emergence of hegemons. Hegemony you know, is the preponderance of power of one state in international system so that it can dominate political, economic and other relations in international relations. So much so that the world starts thinking in, in their terms. They just want to uh, guide the world or they want to follow the world to follow their path. So this is called hegemony and examples of hegemon would be US. And although a lot of people disagree, but uh, uh, just a loose example. Now, if we look at the second typology or second classification, this is based on how you derive power, what is the basis or the source of your power. And on this basis, we talk about, we talk about a country being a great economic power like Japan a great military power or a great political power or a great ideological power like Russia was a leader of the communist or the socialist ideology. So on the basis of different sources, we classify a country as th these different kinds of power. The third typology is based on the nature of use. How, what, how do you use power? Can you use power or can you not use power? So the first definition is called usable and unusable power. And the best example that comes to one's mind is nuclear energy. You may be having nuclear, you may be a nuclear power, but how you use is restricted. So although, and there are many countries who have kept their nuclear power or nuclear technology under wrap, so those countries cannot declare that they have this power. So then nuclear power, which is a great power, becomes unusable. 
usable powers are all those powers which are accounted for. For example, I have 16 aircrafts, we have 200 submarines, we have 10,000 foot soldiers. So, these accounted for these statistical elements that we have, we can use in a fair war are known as usable power. Those things which we cannot declare we have to hide are called unusable power. You know, but it's, it's not that unusable power is not used, you know. There are times when countries they threaten to use nuclear weapon against another country thinking that that country does not have nuclear power. But supposing that country retaliates and says, if you use nuclear weapon against me, I am going to retaliate with nuclear weapons. And what is the effect? The effect is that the other country is, is scared. It, the, this threat acts as a kind of a deterrence to use the nuclear weapon. So, usable and unusable is one classification. The other classification is legitimate and illegitimate power. Now, if you talk about legitimate and illegitimate power, there is one important thing that I would like to tell you. Uh, legitimate is legal and illegitimate is illegal. Now, supposing a person is walking on a street and he is frisked first by a police officer who is carrying a a legitimate search warrant. He holds a gun to you. He asks you to take out your wallet, your all your belongings in your pocket. You do that. And, and you walk a few steps ahead. And there you encounter a robber. He also performs the same act. He also holds a gun. He also asks you to part with your wallet. But the action of the two is very different. While the search by a police officer is legal because he has a legitimate warrant document. The other action by a robber is illegitimate. Therefore, this is known as legitimate power and illegitimate power. So, the power which is legally used by the state is legitimate power and we are talking about use of legitimate power in our discussion today. On the basis of nature of use, then there is a third kind which is known as soft power and hard power. Now, it is a changing world and we have actors who use often use their values, their cultures, their social policies or their social institutions to exert influence. This is known as soft power. So, soft power would be uh, supposing some country is propagating free market, free economy and the other countries get influence. So, they are using this soft power to influence or mold the or move the other country. Then your uh, uh, culture becomes an element of soft power. Hard power is the, it, it involves the use of either military or in recent terms economic aspects or economic elements. For example, um, economic embargo are used against state. So, economy which otherwise used to be a soft power uh, is now being used to arm twist and, and uh, uh, force a country to surrender. Therefore, economy has been used, has been moved from the domain, from the realm of soft to hard power. Now, the other type of power is called relative and absolute power. And I told you at the beginning that one of the important characteristics of power is relative, it is a relative concept. So, we are not talking about absolute power. When we talk about absolute power, it, it means tyranny, tyrannical use of power, the kind that the Nazis and the fascist leaders used to wield. But we are not talking about absolute power. We are talking about relative power and relative power if we define strictly is the ratio of Supposing there are two countries A and B. So, we are, to, we are going to define a relative power as the ratio of power of A to the power of B. That is, it means the power that we can bring to bear against each other, the actual power that we are going to use against each other. This is known as a relative and absolute power. Moving on from here, we would like to uh, 
see how power is exerted, what are the different ways in which power is exerted. Now exerting power could be through various means and we are not going to go into details because uh, the uh, most important focus of today's lecture are the elements of power. So you can issue an order, you can threaten a country, you can go on direct wars with a country, you can use your authority or charisma, a country, a charismatic leader can have their own way uh, in, uh, in place of using any physical force or you can even go on to persuade a country. You go on and on, try, try till you succeed. So these are the different methods in which power is exerted. Now another important discussion whenever we talk about power are measuring power. How do you measure power? And these, the methods of measuring power includes the different elements of power. So basically the entire elements of power are divided into two aspects. We, we will take two aspects. One is tangible and intangible, whether you can count them statistically or you can uh, touch and feel them or you can just, you can just, uh, it, it's an abstract concept which you cannot touch and feel. So tangible and intangible elements of power and the other way is called stable or unstable. Stable are those which are relatively fixed and unstable are those which keep moving. So except for uh, geography or size of a territory, most elements are relatively stable because unless you have a war, you do not seed with your territory. So your territory is more or less fixed unless there is a war in which a part of your territory is annexed by the other part. But others elements are relatively, we could talk about them being relatively stable or by and large they are unstable. So the different elements that we are going to consider are geography, population, natural resources, economic, military and technological elements of power. So let us <coughs> move on to the first element of power. The first element of power is called geography. If we look at geography, geography is mostly relatively stable and it is tangible. You can say that this much of rainfall occurs, the soil is porous or, or it is mountainous soil or it is red soil or the climate is temperate or tropical. So it is a defined thing. Therefore, it is relatively a stable and a tangible element geography. So, you know, if we talk about politics, whenever we use geography in considering our political ambition, this gives rise to the concept of geopolitics and geostrategy. So use of geography in calculating power is called geopolitics. So uh, actors, they start using maps, they start using maps in international power and they say that if we have to align with some other country, that it has to be on the basis of their geographical location. If we have to acquire bases along strategic trade routes, then we have to think in terms of geographical locations. So whenever they are making or breaking relations, they are using geography and this is geopolitics. Then um, the second important consideration about geography is the topography. What is the nature of soil? What is the nature of terrain? That is, do you have mountains? Do you have plains? Do you have deserts or rivers? So these are important considerations in terms of um, international power. For example, if there is a natural mountain barrier, then that gives you an advantage. It erects a natural mountain barrier and you are kind of secured from attack from that side. For example, India from its north is almost secured. So we have other countries like um, uh, Italy, then we have Spain. All these are insulated by the presence of Pyrenees or Alps from the mainland of Europe and this gives them a sizable advantage in terms of being isolated and not too much worrying about imminent attacks. Now, um, if we talk about the location, there are two kinds of locational uh, situation that we may encounter. There are some, 
countries which are landlocked. So they have a country, they are surrounded by countries from all sides, from most sides or at least two sides. And centrally located largely landlocked states like Germany and Russia, they have this, they had this threat of being surrounded by other countries. And then um, they would be attacked, there would be a multi-pronged or two-pronged attack and that made them a, a little vulnerable in terms of international relations. Now Germany typically faced this two-front problem to fight Russia in the west, uh, Russia in east and France in the west simultaneously in World War I and that added to the miseries of Germany. Now, you have less centrally landlocked countries or which are typically called insular countries. The biggest examples are United Kingdom and United States. They have a body of water which protects them against any imminent attack, land attack. But do you think by isolating them through a water body, we are taking care of all their problems? They are only insulated, they are only uh, insulated against any land attacks. But supposing they have to move their men and material or soldiers over long distances, then it is a bit of a problem. It's, a, it's quite a huge problem for them. For example, United States in, during the Gulf War or even during the Cold War had to move its men and material and that was creating a lot of logistical problems for the United States. Now, uh, Having said this, we must consider another aspect of geography which is very, very important and that is size. If you look at the size of the countries except Japan and UK, mostly the big powers, the great powers have been countries which have a sizable territory and that is because See, uh, UK is an exception. UK, despite its size, has been ruling the entire world for so many years, for ages, for decades. But rest, if we, if we leave UK apart and, and in recent times we leave Japan out, there are mostly big powers which have big size. For example, UK is big in size, USSR is huge, Canada is huge, Australia is huge. Now, you know the reason why in recent times size is has become important because if you if it's it's the question of nuclear war and if supposing a bomb is dropped over japan or uk the entire nation can potentially be devastated the same doesn't apply to the bigger countries because even if we bombard one area there will be a sizable section of the territory which will not be affected why this? Why only attack? Even if we talk about testing of um, nuclear weapons, then you need large barren land for testing. And that is why USSR is a huge um, nuclear power. Uh, Canada is a huge nuclear power because they have a lot of land available for testing. India is also becoming a sizable threat because of availability of large, huge landmass which can be used for nuclear testing. Now, uh, but only it's not about size, you know, a, a big country, a huge country which has mostly barren land, which is not uh, uh, likely to be used for cultivation or which does not have enough resources is, is rather like likely to add to the woes of the country. So size with enough resources to support a huge population is an advantage and not any kind of size is an advantage. So if, if we are looking at every aspect of geography, there are certain exceptions. So size is size means big size means big power, exception is UK. Then a big size means a big power, but what if your uh, uh, the quality of your land or quality of your territory is not good, then it becomes a liability rather than an asset. The fourth element of geography which you must consider while determining national power is the climate. And who knows better than Indian people, you know, the tropical condition is harsh 
to work in the open. Not throughout the year, it is very, very difficult to work. You get tired, you get sweaty. So, you know, then people become irritable. They tend to lose their temper. If it is a temperate climate, you know, you have good health. You don't, uh, you don't you're not vulnerable to these typically uh, tropical diseases like malaria and diarrhea and vomiting. So, these are some of the things which are uh, eliminated. Then you, your energy level is high and your temperament is cool. And that is why we have seen in the world that all those which have been big powers have had temperate climate. So, so much so for the climate that the climate is an important factor and more so a temperate climate in determining the power of a country. Now, if you look at the other aspect, the next aspect, and, and just let me add one uh, point to the uh, geography. If it is a good climate, temperate climate, then the agricultural productivity also goes high. So, geography has a lot of say in determining the power of a nation. Now, if we move on to the next element and that is population, there are, there are two aspects of population which we need to keep in mind. One is the quantitative aspect and the other is the qualitative aspect. How big or large is your population? Now, big population has its own disadvantages and disadvantages and so has a small population. So, how do you decide what is the optimum population? Now, we will just take a couple of examples and I will then go on to describe what, how population can be used as an asset. Now, if we look at population and the, using the first parameter, it is, it keeps changing. So, therefore, it is an unstable element, but it is a tangible element. You can count through census how many people you have. Migration or immigration is another reason why population is called unstable. Therefore, if we were to strictly define population, it is unstable, but it is tangible. Now, if you look at the quantity of number of people, does it always mean, let us consider large population. Now, large population will give you enough manpower to be employed in your industry. They will give provide enough manpower to be uh, incorporated or to be uh, recruited in your military uh, forces. It also gives you a bigger market. So, large population has its own advantages. But what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages is are that uh, it, they are a major stress on their limited resources. If you have a large population looking after their health, their edu education, their well-being or their social welfare aspects, they make a major dent on the limited economic resources of a country. Then if you have a huge population, the other disadvantage is that uh, there will be people with different aspirations, there will be people with different identities, there will be people with different ideologies and there will be infightings in the entire population. So, these are the disadvantages of a large population. But how you use your size to your advantage depends entirely on the kind of government you have, the kind of leadership you have. Let us take the example of India and Egypt. Both of them have very large population, but despite the large population, they have never been able to achieve the status of a big economic power because they could not manage their human resources well. It is only in the recent times that we have started doing something about it, but we have not been able to manage our human resources well. Now, the development level has remained low in these two countries because of the size of the population. So, we, we have to keep in mind that size is not always advantages. Even China struggled in the initial years, but now it has been able to use the population to its advantage. So, so we can say that for some countries, the largeness of the population far from being an asset has become an obstacle. 
So what is the precondition to development? And that precondition is population control. So once you achieve a sizable or reasonable population control, your large population can become an asset. Now, uh, as I told you, larger population does not always mean greater power, as we have seen in the case of India and Egypt, and even initially for China. But, you know, China has used its population to its advantage, and so has United States. You know, a sufficiently large population gives you manpower to work in industries. They give you enough people to fill the cadres of the armed forces and um, it provides a huge market. Now, if we look at Australia, which has a huge size, but a very, very small population. So, Australia has never attained the status that UK or US or Germany have because it does not have enough people. So, Australia, Canada have now started opening up their borders to allow for immigration because they feel that by allowing immigration, they can have the advantage of large power by, uh, by allowing those uh, skilled laborers or skilled population to come into their country. And this is how they want to use a large, how to build up a large population in order to use it as an advantage. Now, for example, if we look at the fascists and Nazis, their only threat, stress or emphasis or thrust was on increasing the population more and more. So much so that they would say that women, the more, the more children the women wear, the better it is because we would have a larger population that can be utilized in terms of war. Now, taking the second aspect, which is quality, how, how do you decide what is good population and what is bad population. Now, quality means that if you have a population which is untrained, illiterate, you can never use it to your advantage. So you need to have a population which is trained, which is equipped with managerial skills, which is literate, and then even a small population can have the same kind of output as a large population with low, skill, low skills of human resources. Therefore, one thing which we have to keep in mind in determining quality is the age distribution. Age distribution is that within a given population and there are two or more countries, all other things being equal that is countries with some similar development index, a country with a large population of maximum potential usefulness in terms of military and productive purposes has an edge in power over a nation in which a, po a predominant population of older people exists. So you have to look at the productive age and the productive age is put as 20 to 64 years. So any country which has, a, which has maximum population in this age group of 20 and 64 is likely to be better off because it, the pr maximum amount of population is in the productive age group. Now in, for India, the, uh, this extent may not go to 64. We may have to put, bring it down to 20 to 58 because uh, in India we are generally, we tend to give up after a certain age, we say that we've become old and we need not work. And so this is the difference in mindset between the advanced or developed countries. So now how do you take advantage of, how do you take advantage of your size? Even if it's a small size, you train them. Or even if it's a larger population, you train them. So both aspects, the kind of training that you give in order for skill development is an important determinant of the quality of your population and this quality then adds to your power. So, you know, these were so contentious issues that some countries would say that large size and then somebody, somebody would say skilled and developed human resources. So, uh, United Nations was quite disturbed by these developments and then it 
started it decided that let me let us add an element of human development index in measuring the development of a country and this human development index would take into account life expectancy your education and how what is the per cap capita income of population and it you and thought that it could uh, if we uh, take into consideration human angle in determining power we can take care of many other problems we can compel nations not to spend on nuclear weapons or rather spend on human resource development but you know uh, the irony of the situation is that those countries with higher gdp which are economically developed tend to have higher hdi so it boiled down to the same uh, it didn't make lot of difference now this was about population the third element of geography the third element of power is co are called natural resources if we look at natural resources we have to keep two things in mind a that natural resources improve the bargaining capacity of states and second is that they help in developing a nation industrially economically and militarily so natural resources are is one of the important elements and as we know this is relatively a stable element unless you have depleted your natural resources and it is tangible because you can account for how much barrel of oil does a country have how many tons of coal does a country so you can actually account for your natural resources so it is a relatively stable factor we must say now there are three kinds of things that we have to look at the first thing that we must look at are the food material second are the raw materials and third are oil now if we look at food we have to look in at two circumstances in normal times when a country is not at war a self sufficient country has an advantage over a nation that is not not self sufficient because the deficient country has to depend on supply from other sources and this supply can be uncertain the example was great britain before the second world war grew only 30% of the food consumed and so it had to open its sea route to allow imports whenever the ability of in great britain to import food material was threatened the survival of great britain was put at jeopardy so you have to see that the, the the moment you start importing food you are being guided by external forces so this is this is a very very important criteria in terms of normal times now in normal times supposing a country has been going through permanent scarcity of food so permanent scarcity of food leads to permanent weakness in terms of uh, in international power so a country like india all the uh, underdeveloped countries of asia of africa latin america they have had permanent scarcity of food even india till the green revolution had permanent scarcity of food and these these this aspect of scarcity makes them vulnerable to external forces because they have either to depend on aid or they have to import and importing food uh, leads to a drain of resources they could have done if away with this um, import bill had they been self sufficient in terms of food production so you know so this is clear that permanent scarcity means permanent weakness in international relations now if we look at war times during war a self sufficient country will not divert its national power or will not dilute its policy objectives because it has this consolation that even if they go for war the population would not starve then this gave a lot of solace to united states and ussr whenever they were in times of war now you know in times of war food embargo is often used you know germany Uh, uh, the allied powers often used food embargo against germany 
during the first world war and this you know this makes the enemy vulnerable and you cannot you cannot fight war when your population is starving so this is about food now we take the second aspect of natural resources and these are called raw materials tangible relatively stable now why do you need natural resources natural resources are important for industrial prog production they are also important for your economic progress because these are important for an exchange earners for a country and they are also used in technological warfare for example uh, uranium now let us go back to the to those eras when hand to hand fighting was the norm so it it was the actual the skills of the soldiers which mattered mattered more and sophistication of weapon was not a consideration because we were hardly using weapons now with the advent of modern technological warfare the sophistication the quality of your uh, equipments they are more important than the quality of soldiers therefore you need you need to upgrade your um, equipments your ammunitions and this is when the play, role of natural resources comes into existence now let us go back to the era of great britain now great britain that time um, coal and iron ore in in uh, the pre second world war era coal and iron ore were the most important determinants of uh, your power in terms of warfare if you had enough coal if you had enough iron you could win wars but and that is why uk you know became on top of the world because it had ample ample um, reserves of coal and iron ore now if we go by the same example india which has which is second in terms of coal and iron ore production it is not a huge power so it's not only about existence of uh, a particular raw material but it's also about its utilization now so we come to the second aspect that is utilization of natural resources you may have abundant natural resource but you do not have the industrial capacity to translate them into useful useful material then there is no point because it is it is um, any other natural resources it has no value the only value is that you are exporting it as an unfinished natural resource so utilization of natural resource is another criteria so i would like to stress that utilization rather than mere possession of natural resources is more important in determining power of a nation for example uranium let's talk about uranium now congo has used reserve and that is why congo has become the coveted area where all the major powers come, came into conflict so despite the huge reserve it lacks the industrial capacity to utilize uranium for uh, producing nuclear weapons and there are then other countries canada uh, czechoslovakia russia which have considerable uh, uranium reserves so they have shot up to be big nuclear powers because they had the, the this uh, reserve was um, supported by the industrial capacity that they had so they could make use of this uh, potential reserve so there's one aspect called actuality and potentiality you have actual reserves but the use you're not using them so the potentiality goes down so we'll discuss this when we talk about technological warfare now util therefore i would like to say that Congo has huge uranium reserves but it is not a big power uh, Soviet Union South Africa Czechoslovakia Canada have sizable or minimal uranium reserves but they are big nuclear powers because they have the industrial capacity Now the third aspect about raw material is the changing relevance of natural resources I told you that I have uh, at one point in time uh, coal and iron ore used to be coveted resources now with with the advent of modern warfare uh, nuclear weapons became more important so you had to possess uranium so the relevance has changed 
Now, 60 years ago, coal as a source of energy was of great value. Iron had no substitute, which, make, which made Great, great Britain sh shoot to par. But with 20th century onwards, when the Hiroshima Nagasaki bomb dropping case happened, post that bombing, you, know, you have uh, uranium which has make, become more important. Therefore, the natural resources, they, they, they are not fixed. They, their relevance keeps changing. Now, we come to the third natural resource and that I have treated it as a separate unit of natural resource. It could have been treated as a raw material, but I have not because it is very, very important to tr treat oil separately because after the World War I, oil as a source of energy has become very important. By possessing oil, Soviet Union has become very important and Japan has declined in status because of complete lack of oil deposits, but it, they have made it up by nuclear uh, developments, nuclear technology uh, to produce uh, power. But nonetheless, that was a shortcoming for Japanese situation. Now the so-called Near East or the Arabian Peninsula comprised of small inconspicuous states which lacked all the elements of a great power, but they suddenly shot to power. They realized the importance of this gold yellow reserve. And this is when they, in fact, the 1973 oil crisis was a creation of these uh, Middle Eastern countries. They wanted to control the supply and the prices of oil because they, they realized that oil has huge importance and so far, they are being guided by the different uh, countries which do not even possess these resources to determine how much they have to supply, what price they have to quote in the market. And using this tool of oil crisis or oil embargo, they, they could make many of the countries do what in ordinary times or in normal times they would never have done. So they kind of arm twisted the big powers by the mere possession of these oil fields. Now, um, but oil, you know, has it, it has given a lot of economic instability because the oil prices determination, OPEC acts as a cartel. So it has led to a lot of volatility and economic instability in the world, but at least it has taken power out of the realm of the big five that we always thought of when we were talking about power. Now power has come down to the level of these Middle Eastern countries which, which are very important. Now so much so that oil has given rise to a new concept since the first world war. And this is called oil diplomacy. What is oil diplomacy? It is this establishment of a sphere of influence giving the developed nation excessive access to oil deposits in certain regions. So this is oil diplomacy. So now we are not talking about strict political diplomacy or economic diplomacy or we are not talking about traditional diplomacy. We are talking about a new concept called oil diplomacy. And this is, this brings us to uh, another important element of power, which is economics. But because it is going to be a extended aspect, so I'd rather discuss technology and in the rest of the lectures, I will discuss economy. So technology, I told you, with the advent of modern warfare and with the advent of quality of population becoming more important, we needed technology. So technology we had to use in two or three ways. Technology was to be used in warfare, how you could equip your uh, military with more modern gadgets, how you would use your resources by utilizing them or finishing them in industries. So technology had to be used to increase your industrial capacity. Technology had to be used to uh, train your manpower or for human resources development. And 
Therefore, entire resources, whether it was your economic resource or it was your uh, natural resource or human resource, they could be polished or honed if you used technology. And you know, there's one important aspect that I would like to discuss here is that what happens is in terms of technology, the advantage that technology gives is that you have certain resources, you have certain economic uh, resources. Now these are your actual resources that you possess. Now to make them into potential elements of power or potential sources of power, you have to make certain transformations in them. How you bring about transformations in your natural resources or human resources or economic resources is through the use of technology. And therefore, technology is that aspect which bridges the gap between actuality and potentiality of resources. So I would just like to conclude the discussion by, it's, it's not a, a general, it's not a, a ultimate conclusion because I have to continue the lecture. But some things I would like to just say that um, success or failure of a country does not depend on how much power you have, but it depends on how well you have used it. And if we have gone by the realist definition, real politics always revolves around power. We do not talk about goodness of human behavior or, or the quality of leaders or the foreign policy objectives. We just talk about power. And craving for power often spills beyond national territories. That is another conclusion that I would like to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for these uh, very thought-provoking ideas and very interesting lecture we had today. And of course, as ma'am in indicated already, we are going to carry this forward, talking about power, its elements, and uh, its limitations as, as, uh, as well. So, friends, with this, we take your leave, but not without thanking, ma'am. Thank you so thank much, ma'am, for coming. And please, uh, we are looking forward to see you tomorrow as well. And again, thank you, friends, for watching. Thank Have you. a wonderful day.